afternoon everybody remember the golden rule remember the golden rule you sit when you are told to sit right let's bow our head for a word of prayer our gracious and loving heavenly father we come before your holy presence in the name of our dear lord jesus christ this afternoon thank you for being with us this past two days thank you for speaking to us this morning through your dear servant thank you for making your ways known to us lord now we are gathered before your presence one more time this afternoon lord jesus your dearly beloved children have come from all over this nation and also from afar off to hear what god will speak to this nation particularly and thereby those who are from afar off can draw principles from there and thereby learn what they should do for themselves and for their nations now i ask you holy one of israel the lord jesus who is meek full and lowly of heart give us a humble heart right now to hear with all humility what is at stake before us and what you are calling us to do that we may unite our hearts together in all humility and in contrition to implore your mercy and your favor and we pray that hearing our prayer of contrition and seeing our broken heart you may pour out the spirit of supplication and grace upon this great nation that it will be flooded with your love and with your goodness lord lord your word says one shall put a thousand to flight and two shall put 10000 to flight they are more than two in this congregation lord certainly they can put many millions to flight you will only do that when you see all hearts united together in oneness and in brokenness so now we invite you lord jesus to come and speak to us and make your ways known to us in the name of our blessed lord jesus we pray amen, amen. please be seated now i was pondering very much before the lord what i should come and share with you this afternoon and while the worship was going on i was just reminded of one thing you know we have gathered here for this conference at a very important period of history in australia but the dates of this conference were planned last year way before this crisis that is looming before your nation so god who calls the end from the beginning knowing what crisis you are going to face at this point of time call for the put in the hearts of the leaders of this conference the dates the exact dates prior to which you are going to have or face a crisis so that you can hear 
what options or choice God puts before you, like a way of escape. You know, throughout history in the Bible, whenever God speaks of judgment, or God warns of an impending judgment to come, he always gives you the reason why he's chastising or disciplining. Secondly, he also makes a way of escape. How you can escape from all this. So he puts all that before the people. The options are always there. You can avert the whole thing or you can just do nothing about it and just be swept away by the tide. There are some judgments that you cannot do anything about it. It has been determined and it will certainly come to pass. There's nothing you can do about it except saving yourself. A good example of this is found in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, Abraham prayed so much, but the judgment that was determined upon Sodom and Gomorrah came to pass. The city could not be saved. However, because of the intercession of Abraham, and also because of the righteous lifestyle of Loth, only him, he and his family were safe. The rest of the city, twin cities, not just twin city, no, there were actually two plus five. So there were altogether seven cities of which so Sodom and Gomorrah were the most famous or kind of they were the fathers and the mothers for the rest of the five cities to fall into gross sin. So all seven cities were destroyed by fire that came down from heaven. But Lot, his wife, and his two virgin daughters were safe. But then there are also cases where an entire judgment over a nation is totally averted. A very good example of this is Nineveh. You know, and you heard a wonderful message from Brother Neville on the first night, first, uh, second, uh, first day, second session, that because God had already prepared the nation through famines, through plagues, through a solar eclipse, they were scared to death. They were rather prepared through scaring. That is also the goodness of God. Scaring, you know. And so when Jonah came, this natural disasters had already prepared the way for the message of Jonah. He was the last person. When he blew the trumpet, the whole nation repented. And therefore, the judgment that was to come upon Nineveh was totally averted. Jonah was Nineveh's last chance. If they had not paid heed to Jonah's message, Nineveh would have been totally destroyed like how Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. You know, eventually Nineveh was destroyed as Jonah had prophesied, but not after 100 years of grace. In the same manner, God extends grace to some nations. One particular nation that is enjoying God's grace at this point of time is the United States of America. That is why God has given them a president, a man after God's own heart. Mr. Trump, you know, he may be rough 
in his speech, unmannered, uncultured, different ways of talking like how we talk. However, <laughs> however, he is a very prayerful man. He is a prayerful man, godly man, God-fearing man. And you know, when he took office, the first thing that he did was to clean up the White House. And they discovered during the eight years of the presidency of Obama, he, there were many, many idols that were brought and kept in the White House. Many, many hundreds of idols of different religions, Hindus, Buddhists, you name it, everything. And he cleaned the White House of all the idols and restored prayer in the White House. Amen. See, he is God's man. And God has given the nation four years of grace. Four years during his presidency. Four last years of grace. To put their house in order. Now this is the very message that I shared in the US last August at a conference at a place called Moravian Falls. Four years of grace. If they clean their house, if they put their house in order, that grace will be extended for another four years. Because each American president can serve for two terms. So another four years. So four plus four. Eight good years. More than the seven years that was given to Egypt. If they don't put their house in order, then the four years or lesser that the nation will go into captivity. Now, you have before your eyes you as, as an example. But even in this captivity, I mean, even in these good years, when we make wrong choices, God disciplines the nation. See, like for example, two years ago, I was leaving Los Angeles airport to go to Houston. And a mighty angel came and stood beside me when we were standing in the airport. And the angel identified himself as the angel of United States. And he had a huge sledgehammer in his hand. He was so gigantic in size. And he said, we are going to strike this city with an earthquake. Strike means strike this region, mean the Californian region, with an earthquake. And when he spoke that, I saw hundreds of angels lining up in a line all over the Californian region with, all, with sludge hammers ready at a given notice to bang on the ground. And when they did, there will be a massive earthquake all along California. Six months later, Hollywood released a movie called San Andreas. The very place that I saw the angels were going to strike for a massive earthquake. And then he also told me that three other places have been predetermined, pre-selected for earthquakes to rock the nation. Three places. And I don't know which are the three places. The only one place I know was California. And this will be massive earthquakes that will break the nation apart to pieces. I mean the whole continent of US will cease to exist. It will break apart in three pieces. And the Atlantic Sea, ocean, will all flow into the hinterland. So I was scared and trembling when I received this word. 
And all throughout the journey from Los Angeles to Houston, a journey of three hours by flight, I had no peace. I was so troubled by this prophecy. And I kept on praying and asking God, why, 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 Lord? Why? And when I landed at Houston airport, as soon as I came out of the plane and set feet on the soil of Houston, the word of the Lord came unto me, this city will be attacked, will be destroyed by a massive flood. Now I, I was already saddened and sick by what I heard in Los Angeles. Now I'm hearing another worse thing. So I thought, I personally, honestly I thought to myself, I must be a very bad luck person. <laughs> anyway I go, I'm not bringing any good news. I'm only bringing bad news. Must be very bad luck, isn't it? No? It's good luck? Anyway, so in the meeting in Houston, I shared what God showed me about the great destruction that's going to come to Houston by a flood. And you know what happened last week. According to the word that was spoken, the entire city of Houston was flooded. And the news media is saying it will take years for Houston to be rebuilt again. It will take years, not months, years. Now, we have these warnings before us now. Now, Australia, East and the West. You know, there is a spiritual connection between United States and Australia. I don't, know, I don't know whether you know this or not, but there is a spiritual connection. What happens in the West has a counter effect on the Eastern part of this world in Australia. You know, both are on two extremes. Australia is on the far east of the world and US is on the far west of the world, from one end of the world to another end of the world. You know, one amazing thing, in our television network, we have launched 12 channels that cover the whole world in eight different major languages. When we first started, it was just one channel that we beamed our programs into India. And then three years later, in 2008, we launched a second channel to Europe, so that all the people in Europe, not only the Indians living there, but also the Europeans will hear the word of the Lord. The following year, when I was praying, the Lord told me to launch two channels. He said, one in the US and one in Australia. Why connect the two together? He said, from one end of the earth to another end of the earth. Launch two channels at the same time. So, the two years later in 2010, we launched two channels, both in the English language, to these two continents, in Australia and in North America. And just as there is a large gay movement in the United States, likewise you have a large gay movement in Australia. There is a spiritual connection between the two. You know why? Because both these continents are gateway continents. One is the eastern gateway, another is the western gateway. Both are gateways. And when both are something begins in two, when it stretches out its hands to join, it covers the whole world, all the nations of the world. So this conference, we are gathered here for a very, very 
strategic period of time. All of you are like Esther. Or this conference is like Esther. You know, among the many words in the book of Esther, the most prominent sentence that we all know too well is the sentence for such a time as this, complete it. You have come into the kingdom. Likewise, for such a time as this, this conference is organized. And listen to the words of Esther. When Mordecai told her to do something about it, she feared for her life. She said, I can do that. Or another way to say is she, like she couldn't be bothered for what is going to come upon the nation. She, I can do that. And Mordecai was very upset with her and he turned around and he told her, see, he was a no-nonsense uncle. <laughs> he never means his words. Mordecai did not pamper his knees. She was like a daughter to him. When her parents died, he brought her up like one of his own daughter. But now, he stood like in the office of a prophet and he rebuked her very sharply and sternly told her, okay, if you want, don't want to do anything about it, fine. But remember, when we all go down, you will also go down. When we all die, you will also die. Don't think you will escape just because you are the queen. Don't think that. So in the same manner, if the law is passed for a yes, all of you will fall. So please don't forget that. You know, most Christians have a very conceited view about themselves. They always think that we are better than everybody else. That we are beyond the touch by Satan, even by God. <laughs> you know, that's what we think, you know. We think that even God cannot touch us. Because we, like what we always say, we, we are covered by the blood. <laughs> Nothing can touch us. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see? You sing that song. So, we have a deluded mindset that nothing can touch us. Not even God. No angels can touch us. You think like that. See, when the nation of Israel went into 70 years of captivity, righteous Daniel was in captivity. Righteous Ezekiel, righteous Ezra, righteous Nehemiah, righteous Jeremiah, they were all in captivity. These are all righteous men and women of God. They were all in captivity. When the judgment falls, even the righteous will fall. Of course, God will preserve the righteous. But you go into 70 years of captivity. Now suppose the vote is yes. Let's look at the negative side first. Suppose the word is yes, and then your parliament passes the law. Okay, same-sex marriage bill is passed. Not only same-sex marriage bill will be passed, do you know that even the educational system will be changed? That all your children, from small, they will be taught that there is not only a father and mother, but there is also a father and father, mother and mother. 
You know, a year ago, I was very shocked to see some emoji cons in the iPhone that has the icons of a family, father, mother, children, and then the other icon is father, father, mother, mother, and children. I took several looks at that to see, is my eyes playing tricks? <laughs> and when I look closely, they were promoting a gay alternate lifestyle. So now you can send an emojicons to promote that. And in Europe, in one nation in Europe, it has become mandatory from January 1 of next year that all the school system will teach the children from grade one about this alternate lifestyle. Can you imagine your little six and seven year old goes to school and comes back, looks at you, Pastor Paul and Mrs. Paul, will look at you with a strange look and ask you, Father, why mother is mother and not father? <laughs> Don't laugh. This will become a reality. Or it will look at Mrs. Paul and say, Mommy, why father is not mommy? Pastor Andy, your son will come back and ask you this question, right? So what, what will you answer your kids? They will be indoctrinated in their schools. What will you do? So our, the next generation are going to be indoctrinated to accept or be part of an alternate lifestyle. This is not only this is happening in Europe, already started in the US, you are next in the least. Not only you, Taiwan has become the first nation in Asia to have passed the same-sex marriage bill. First nation in Asia, a conservative Asian nation. And China is next in line. Singapore is next in line. India is next in line. You know, in Indian parliament, they are now debating. They have already passed the transgender law. Transgenders now have equal rights as any other ordinary citizens. And transgenders have their own toilet now. Male, female, and question mark. See, these are all becoming realities. Just as what the Lord Jesus had warned us. As it was in the days of Lord, so shall it be in the last days. So this is a sign that these are the last days. So what are we going to do? The scripture says, righteous Lord, vex his soul. He kept himself pure. That's all he did, you know. Kept himself pure. Sat at the gate of the city and cried every day for the sins of the land. He was not like a Noah who went and preached righteousness. He did not do that. He just took care of his own soul. That's all he did. So what are we going to do? The whole of yesterday afternoon, the committee has been deliberating what they will do. Now before they come and share what they will do. So this morning as I was waiting on the Lord, the Lord gave me a few things to share with you so that you will know what is required out of you. This is called, or my message is entitled, The Urgency of the Warning. 
Noah, during his time, was warned of an impending judgment that was going to come upon the whole world. So he was warned. Now why of all the people in the world was Noah chosen and he was warned? Why? Genesis chapter 6 verse 8 and 9 tells us why? Because of two reasons. One, he was perfect in all his generations. Which tells us that when there was an intermingling of the spiritual seed and a human seed, his generations were unspotted. His entire generation, his lineage, there was no corruption. He was pure and clean. Number two, the scriptures tells us he walked with God. So he had a personal relationship with God that was very strong. That was healthy. It was not a relationship that he only did when he was, when, or when he felt like doing. Pastor Jose made a statement earlier. He said, those of you who want, can go to our book table, pick up a form, and uh, to be a prayer partner, you can pray whenever you feel like praying. That is not walking with God. Whenever you feel like praying. When you walk with God, you have a consistent walk. See, when there is a father or mother in a family, the children, when they look up to you, they don't look up to you as father and mother whenever they feel like calling you father and mother. <laughs> right? You are always a father, you are always a mother because you are always being a father and a mother. It's not like you switch off being a father one day and you tell your child, don't call me father today, call me uncle. <laughs> today I'm an uncle to you. Or today I'm an aunt to you. Then the following day, two days later, you switch on the button, said now you can call me dad because I'm a father to you today. Do you do that? You don't. Similarly, when you walk with God, it is a consistent walk. The church must be a praying church. That is the purpose of the church. The Lord Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. A church should be a house of prayer, not just a social club where you come to have fellowship exchange your business cards, and then talk about rugby. <laughs> yeah, Australians like rugby, don't you? See, I know. <laughs> this little much about you. Talk about rugby, cricket, India is better than Australia. <laughs> so we'll not talk about cricket, okay? We are better. <laughs> rugby, you are best. So we'll talk about rugby, your great pastime. The church must be a praying church. We have so much of worship today, so much of good teaching today, but very little praying. That is why we are weak, we are dead, we have a name, we have life, but the church today is like the Saudis church. You have a name, but you are dead. You have no life. Prayer is the lifeline. Lifeline. You know, prayer is not just praying for the people. It's good the elders should pray for the people, but that's not just, the, it is. There must be corporate prayer in the church. Praying for so many needs. Praying, talking unto God. The whole church talking to God at the same time. Not just singing to God. The pattern must change. If you don't change the pattern, then you won't survive in these last days. The church pattern must be restored back 
to the original pattern that God called the church to be. That is why when the Lord Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the first thing that he did was cleanse the temple. He got rid of everyone who just pretends to be a priest. Every person that the Lord Jesus whipped were priests. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Levites, they were the ones whom he chased out of the temple. Why? Instead of being priests, they were businessmen. They became managers. They became like corporate executives who run their church, not like the house of God, but like a corporation. You have that today, don't you? See, look at what the church has become today. If the Lord Jesus walked into any church today, he will do the same thing. He will take a whip and start from the pulpit. Don't laugh. This is not a laughing matter. Do you think you are better than your pastor? He will start from the pulpit. And then he will go down the aisle and whip out everyone who has taken the name of the Lord in vain. Everyone who had made money out of the house of God. Everyone who has stolen God's money. The tithes and the offerings has come to the church does not belong to the pastor or doesn't belong to the church committee. It is God's money. Of course, the the leadership who serves the Lord can take a salary for themselves. But it is still God's money. You don't touch the gold. That's God's. And he will whip out everyone. You have no right to take the money of God and invest it in stocks and bonds. You have no right to do that. The money should not stay in stocks and bonds. The money is supposed to go out to help the poor. Amen. That's what the house of God is for. You know, if you read Malachi chapter 3, it says, let bring your tithes and offerings that they may be meat in my house. And the meat is to feed the poor, is to do the works of God, not for the money to lay eggs in the bank. What good is it for it to lay eggs in the bank? What good when you have a world out there dying? You are to feed the poor. You are to send your money to missions to spread the gospel. For that purpose, God instituted this system of tithes and offerings. Not for you to build your empire or build a golden palace a castle and sit there. You know, the Lord will come with a whip in his hand to whip out every false pastor, every false prophet, every false apostle, every false teacher, and every false evangelist. They will all be whipped out of the church. And God will raise a new breed of people. He will raise up the children. He will raise up the youths. He will raise up the women. He will raise up the nobodies and anoint them with the powers of the age to come. And you will do great works for God. This is what God is going to do next. So either we put our house in order or our house will be destroyed. We have a choice. So Noah was called because he walked before God with a perfect heart. And then when he was warned, he did two things simultaneously. Number one, Second Peter chapter two verse five tells us, he warned the people by preaching righteousness. He went everywhere around his cities and preached that a flood was coming. And he preached asking the people to turn back from sin. Secondly, Genesis chapter 6, 
verses 14 to 16 tells us, he built the ark. Now what does the ark represent? The kingdom of God. He did not build the ark for himself. Please listen. The original purpose for God to ask him to build the ark was to store all the animals. Even, you know, among all the people who live at that time, God only found the animals to be righteous. <laughs> only the animals were righteous and clean and pure in his sight. That is why all the animals were brought into the ark. No other people made it into the ark except Noah's family. Right everybody? So he built a big ark. So what does that tell us? Noah did not build his own kingdom. He built the kingdom of God. So this is another last day's attitude that ministers of God should have. You don't just build your church. You must build the corporate kingdom of God. Anyone who is still going to be interested to build your own church, you'll be washed away by the flood. To survive in these last days, only the kingdom of God cannot be washed away. See, when Nebuchadnezzar built a huge statue, the end part of the dream was he saw a mountain not made with hands come hurtling through space and hit the statue and it broke to pieces and that mountain grew to be an exceedingly great mountain and filled the whole earth. Every man-made structure, man-made system, See, there is a man will all be destroyed in these last days. Amen. Only the kingdom of God will survive these end times. So if you are a minister of God, quit building your own kingdom. Quit having a very self-centered, conceited viewpoint. Don't have this attitude, my church, my service, my tithes, my offerings. Yeah. That my, my, my must die. Yeah. Yeah. Why can't two churches together say our church, yeah. our tithes? Why can't the tithes be separate, divided equally between the two? See? The day that you can come to that, that's the day you have died to the great I. And the kingdom of God has started in you. It's not my church member. No pastors own the church members. No pastor can claim my sheep. I once had a debate with a pastor, you know, very learned theologian with double doctorate degrees. I had none. <laughs> so we were talking and then asking, I said, Pastor, tell me one thing. Why? Because in the course of conversation, he kept, he kept on saying, my sheep, my sheep, my sheep. So I asked him, Pastor, how many hours a day do you spend praying for your sheep? Please don't laugh. This is not funny. This is not funny, this is not comical. So he kept quiet. So okay, how many minutes a day? No answer. So then I went to my next question. Do you fast and pray for your sheep? No answer. Now this is a man of God who is a very brilliant theologian. Brilliant theologian, knows the Bible like the back of the hands. When he preaches, he never opens the Bible and he can quote every scripture from memory, from Genesis up to Revelation. 
I am always amazed when I hear him quoting all the scriptures. He didn't need to open the Bible. And he's got also a master's degree in counseling. He's got a string of titles. He's got a big church and a good reputation in a certain denomination. This is his background. And he's been a pastor for more than 20 years. So to my second question, he had no answer. So then I went to my third question. Have you ever suffered any harm or any infliction on your body on account of your sheep? Again, he was silent. So I said, Pastor, you, did not, you don't pray for your sheep. You don't fast and pray for your sheep. You have never suffered any wounds on your body for your sheep. How dare you call the church members your sheep. The Lord Jesus lives ever to make intercession for his people. Amen. Secondly, the Lord Jesus gave his life for the sheep. He is the owner of every sheep. You are not. So how can you stop calling them your sheep? They are not your sheep. Because a good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. That's a good shepherd. That's a good pastor. A good pastor will stand in the gap. And pray for his sheep. Pray for his church members. That's what a good shepherd is. He will be the first to lay down his life. You know, in the Navy, there is a code of conduct. In the event of a danger to the boat, the captain is the last person to leave the ship. The rest, he will be the first person to send off everybody to safety, and the captain is the last person to leave the ship. And by the time he's the last person, he goes down into the waters. But today, the shepherd, the pastor is the first person to leave the sheep. They don't just leave the sheep, they carry suitcases of gold, silver, and dollars and cents. You know how sad and pathetic the condition of the church is today. So now you tell me, why shouldn't God punish you? Why shouldn't God send judgment? Now each time I stand before God, this is a question he asks me, you know. Why should I not send judgment? How to answer him? I was once interceding very much for the US to withhold the hand of God from judging US. And I brought many biblical examples before the Lord. So I said, Lord, based on what you did for Nineveh, why can't you stop doing what you intend to do towards the US? And the Lord looked at me and he asked me a question. He said, when Jonah preached in Nineveh, the king got out from his throne, put on sackcloth, sat in ashes, and repented. He looked straight at me and asked, can you promise me that Obama can do that? I rest my case. I couldn't answer that question. Would he? Would your prime minister do that? So, then why should God withhold his hand? Even the churches don't care. You know, I keep on remembering what I saw in heaven when I stood before the council in heaven, before the elders, when I was praying for you, praying for Australia, and I saw the prophet Elijah, he was very furious. You know, when he put forth his charges, he said, 
The churches are sleeping. He was very furious when he spoke that. When I saw his, the way he spoke, I could guess this was how he behaved in 1 Kings chapter 18 before, all, before King Ahab and before all Israel that were gathered together. And he put forth charges after charges. The churches are sleeping. The churches don't care. They are self-centered. They are just thinking about themselves. And when I look at the situation of the churches here, it is no better. It is no better. You know, when you have like a noose around your neck just hanging above your head, and when the urgency was spoken, and then there is a prayer meeting that was announced here. As soon as yesterday's afternoon session ended, what did many of you do? You ran all into a beeline to follow the speakers. You forgot that there was a prayer meeting here. Many of you stayed, because I, when I was walking out, I turned back to see how many were staying. And many were running after the speakers to get a personal blessing. Here, you have a crisis in your nation. You don't seem to care. You know, all the three speakers, we will leave Sydney on the 10th. But you are going to stay in this nation. Whatever law that is passed here, it will affect you directly. Don't you care? You don't seem to. The churches don't seem to. To them, their own church services are more important. My church service, my Sunday service, my meetings, my people. You're not willing to throw down all those barriers, come together as one united body, forget about your Sunday services. You have a crisis, come together. Take hold of the horns of God. Plead before God. Who knows? Even, you know, the Nineveh king said this word. Who knows if God cannot be moved with mercy? Those words came from a wicked king of Nineveh. The Bible calls that the people of wicked Nineveh were exceedingly wicked. And such a wicked king can bend his knees, sit in sackcloth, put away his crown, and with humble heart look up, and he says, let's all cry to God. Let everybody fast, mothers, children, even the little babies were denied drinking milk. The animals were denied their food. They were all crying out to God. That is why God was moved with compassion towards the nation. But what do we do today? Only a handful comes for prayer. And you give all kinds of silly excuses by saying, no, I have to send my children to school. That is very important to me. Here you have a crisis. And how do you respond in a crisis? You don't care. You know, I tell you very honestly, all during this morning, I felt very, very sad for you when I saw the situation yesterday and I saw how everybody behaved after a solemn word like that. You just didn't care. And I broke down before God this morning when I remembered the words of the Saint Elijah when he said, these people don't care. They don't care. The churches don't care. The pastors don't care. Looking at you, that's how the situation is. You don't care. But that was not the attitude of Noah. For 100 years, he preached and he built the ark at the same time. Secondly, King Hezekiah. 
We read in the Bible in 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, or 2 Kings chapter 18, that he was threatened with war by the king of Assyria, Sennacherib. When he received a letter of an impending notice of attack, what was his immediate response? Second Kings chapter 19, verses 1 and verses 14 to 19 tells us he fasted and he prayed. That's what he did. He fasted and he prayed, he lifted up his hands unto God, and he cried out. And what is the result of that prayer? God sent deliverance to true ways. One, Second Kings chapter 19, verses 6 and 7 tells us, first God sent Isaiah the prophet to give a word of encouragement that comforted the heart of the king. Secondly, in Second Kings chapter 19, Verses 20 to 35, God heard the prayer of Hezekiah and sent a mighty angel who with one swipe killed 185,000 of Assyrian soldiers. Not only that, King Sennacherib who mocked at God and he mocked God saying to Hezekiah, who do you think your God is? Your God cannot save you from my hands. For speaking such arrogant words, we read that King Senagarib was killed by his two sons when he was praying before his idols. So the king who boasted so proudly, he himself was killed. Now thirdly, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Please turn your Bibles with me. There are many lessons that we can learn from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, which can be very, very useful to the situation that is impending before Australia. In 2 Kings chapter 20, you will read that the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Nunimites came against King Jehoshaphat. They had planned a war to come against Judah in the south for whom King Jehoshaphat was the king. And there was a war. Now what did Jehoshaphat do? Look at verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. It is natural to feel fearful. Natural. You cannot, no matter how a person of faith you are, you will somewhere or other, you will have an ounce of fear. Am I right, everybody? We'll all have that. It is part of our emotions. But look what he did. In the midst of that, the first thing or the rightful thing he did was to seek the face of God. He did not call his committee. He did not call his cabinet ministers to discuss and talk. What shall we do? No talking. First seeking the Lord. First praying and seeking. Then he felt in his heart the whole nation, a corporate fast. Everyone should be called for a fast because the situation is very grave. Judah was no match to the combined army of the three nations. She was no match. So Jehoshaphat knew very well, even if he took his army to war, they would be wiped out. He knew that. So he bent his knees and he began to seek the Lord. That's the first thing that he did. He called for a corporate fast. And you read from verses 6 to 13, how he poured out his heart 
in prayer unto God. Now look at verse 13. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. So everybody, all the children were pulled out from their schools. Schools were all closed. Even if there were schools, they didn't care. They pulled out their children. All the wives stopped cooking. They all gathered together in the square where their gatherings took place. They all fasted and they prayed. She looked at the first sentence in verse 13. All Judah stood before the Lord. All Judah, everyone. And the counsel of the Lord for you is, gather as many pastors and people as you can. You should gather, which means it is beyond this group. You should gather them, not just do it among yourselves. To do among yourselves, the counsel would not have come, gather. Am I right, everybody? The counsel, remember the counsel, gather as many as you can. Noah warned as many as he could. He did it, he did his best. And God did not hold him guilty. He did it, but nobody cared. So all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. So what is the result of that prayer? Verse 14. Then upon Jahaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Baniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asap, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation, and he prophesied. Look at the last sentence in verse 15. The battle is not yours, but God's. Now, this is similarly the counsel that God gave you when you all bend your knees, you fast and you pray, God will send forth an army of angels all throughout this land that everyone who receives the word card, the angels will move their hearts to say no. That is the work of the angels. That is what it means, the battle is the Lord's and not yours. You don't fight the battle anymore. Now the Lord will fight the battles. Now look at verse 20. The response of King Jehoshaphat. Now a prophet came, he delivered a word so what is the nation going to do now? And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. So shall you be established. Believe his prophets. So shall you prosper. You hear the word of God, that God speaks through a vessel. But your first belief is to the Lord God. Second, you believe the word that God spoke through a vessel. Amen. 